Hello and welcome to the latest in our reflections from Dundee. I'm Roderick Graham, the Minister at Camperdown and Lockheed Churches, and I'm the Senior Minister, the Lead Minister of the team. Uh, this month, uh, we're into January, and we've kind of left Christmas behind, but we've now entered what's called the season of Epiphany when we're going to reflect on the story of the Magi, the wise men from the East. And we'll be saying more about that in a moment because we're going to be looking at the star of Bethlehem. But before we do any of that, let's begin with a prayer that reflects our theme for this session. Send us a star, O Lord, gently to show us the star child we look for, Send us a star, O Lord, late or early, so that we shall not miss where he is. Send us a star, O Lord, to show us the way into the heart of this new year. Send us a star, O Lord, narrowly shining, that we may be broadened and see you shining already in deeds that ennoble, in hands that heal, in lives that rescue, in the refusal of some to be bitter, and in the readiness of some to forgive. Send us a star, O Lord, one in a million, loud in the sky, and in sending us that star, may we be guided to the Christ child. Amen. Amen. We are delighted to have with us, and unfortunately, because of Tier 4 restrictions, uh, we're having to do this in virtual space um, rather than in physical space as we normally would. But nevertheless, Alistair has bravely <laughs> agreed to join us for this session. Alistair Montgomery is a retired GP uh, who served in Dundee, and I'm just going to ask Alistair just to tell us a little bit about himself before we start our conversation this this today well uh, hello I, i'm asking because i think there's probably very little to say about me but um i'm in the second half of my 60s now been retired for a few years um i, I actually in some ways uh, burnt out and during the course of my uh, career in, in medicine it was uh, took us toll on me but um i i worship at uh, logies and st john's cross and i think it's fair to say i was spotted by another minister headhunter at a zoom bible study and um it was she suggested that um i might be an appropriate person much to my surprise um to uh, join you um uh, for this reflections or the, these reflections on on scientific matters and 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 the star of david star of bethlehem and of uh, and and of the magi so here i am uh, as i say i'm in my late 60s so if I have seen your moments, I um, hope you'll be uh, <laughs> pardon me for that. <laughs> I'm sure we will, Alistair. I'm sure we will. And um, like me, Alistair, because I'm obviously I came from a scientific background uh, as studying astrophysics. So in a way, I, I suppose we're both quite relieved to find that we have wise men, uh, magi, um, scholars in the Bible at all. Uh, it's quite nice to be able to at least <laughs> at least they're well, there. <laughs> I mean, because we have people like Daniel, um, who was incorporated into the you know, the royal court of Babylon and trained up in in all the all, 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 you know, all the science of the day, and even before that, you you're going back of hundreds of years. You have Solomon, who concocted um, vast arrays of, uh, of of research on plants and animals and all sorts of things, and then Moses himself was raised in the Egyptian court. And he would have been well versed in Egyptian law. And before Moses, we had um, Joseph who were interpreting dreams in the court of Pharaoh. So um, wisdom and wisdom literature and understanding and nature go back a long way, actually, within the biblical narrative. At, um, so the the yes indeed and and just thinking of of Moses I'm sure he was also well versed in in what would have been the astrology of of the Egyptian court because the Egyptians obviously were very well versed in in astrology um uh long before the Babylonians who we'll come to in a moment <laughs> yes but, um, so uh, let's just kick off Alistair just to have a little chat about science and religion which is obviously the the one that that 
um, for some reason, always seems to crop up. And I think Darwin probably has a lot to answer for. Um, the media have described this 2020, the passing year, as the year of science. Uh, given the work on the COVID vaccine and the various treatments of the virus, do you think that it means that science has become the new messiah? Is science the new deliverer, the new saviour for the general population? I'm sure some people would love to believe that and some people would love to be the high priests of the new religion of, of science and, and be there in all the chat shows and the television shows and aerial pundits and pontificating in uh, world climate uh, change conferences at the World Health Organization, etc, etc, etc. I suspect the, the, the general population is divided on this. Um, I mean, I've got great respect for science. I mean, the whole of my life's career has been built on the findings um, of science, of scientists before me. Um, and I would not have been able to deliver a lot of the medical care to my patients sure. with, without that grounding in science. So yes, I have, I have great respect for science, but it's, it's a tool um, and it's got to be used correctly. And it, it's open to misuse and to abuse. And it can, uh, even the, the correct use of science can be misreported. And the, the press, God bless them, I, I get the impression are, are there for a good story rather than necessarily the truth. And um, will sensationalize and dramatize uh, things as, as much as they can to get more uh, publicity. Um, and to, to be the first there, you, know, you, you read it here first sort of thing to, and to get more viewers and also to provide entertainment. I think certainly this year has been a year of science. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, but uh, is, is it fair to compare it with other very valid scientific discoveries and endeavors elsewhere um, over the last decade, the last century, and the, the whole of our life revolves around science? I, no doubt the scientists working on the vaccines have done a remarkable job in doing what they've done. It wasn't entirely new technology, but one has to bear in mind, of course, there's, there's three vaccines available. There's the new mRNA, which is relatively new technology, but has been used in cancer therapies. But this is the first time it's been used to actually try and create immunity to an infectious disease. Then there's the, the Oxford or AstraZeneca um, um, uh, vaccine, which is, they've adapted a, a, a harmless coronavirus by adding bits onto it to make it look like the coronavirus. And then of course you've got, um, I forget the name, of this French firm in Livingston which has developed a, a traditional vaccine which is an inactivated whole virus, which I gather also the, the Russian one is as well. Yes, um, I think so that's got, right. Yep. So you've got th th three different types of vaccines and you know, some people might be a bit uh, apprehensive about going for new technology uh, not knowing what uh, introducing genetic material will do to you, although I gather the mRNA is not meant to last that long, which is why you've got to get two doses of it. Mm -hmm. But the, if, if you're apprehensive, then the, the, certainly the French one would be the more traditional line to, to go along. And there's absolutely no doubt that immunization down through the ages has absolutely transformed uh, medical care. Um, you think of smallpox, um, although it took 300 years to eradicate smallpox off the face of the earth. And um, you know, if people think we're going to eradicate the coronavirus within a few months. I think they're, they're being, well, they've got certainly faith in the new religion, haven't they? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and then there's, uh, the other thing that actually worries me a little bit is that there's, has the media been fair in um, reporting all the advances? Because a lot of doctors elsewhere have been looking at old medicines to see whether they actually work in this situation. And of course, we had all the contro controversy about hydroxychloroquine. Uh, I'm not going to go there because I, I think the jury's still out there. But there's now a lot of doctors in both Australia and America who are saying that ivermectin is a very, very good medicine for, for treating. This has been around for 30 years and perfectly safe. And when combined with doxycycline, it can work extremely well. And you know, that may be another route we could go down, but we don't hear much about it. And uh, I don't know why. Um, um, it may be that what we're hearing from America is false or fake news. I, I, I haven't got 
I, I haven't got to tell. The, and, uh, but people have been testifying in front of the Senate committees about this. So I assume that there must be some basis for it. Um, so, so um, picking up the point about <clears throat> science being the, 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 you know, the, the new religion, um, have we also perhaps seen though, you know, because the church has had to respond to the technological challenges of COVID, have we perhaps seen this also as in some ways the year of faith, whereby we've reached out, you know, through food banks and um, through uh, online services to a much wider population than perhaps we hitherto would have done. Oh, I think so. I mean, I was very struck by the last reflections um, with the, inter the interview and, and also the hymn that was chosen by Sidney Kartner, um, When I Needed a Neighbour, Were You There? And I, mean, I can remember seeing that as a, as a teenager at school <laughs> and having, you know, it's a very powerful uh, hymn or, or a chorus or whatever you like to call it and with a very real practical message. And I think, uh, I mean, it's all very well for people like me to hear pontificate and give theories online, but where the rubber hits the tarmac is when what people do in, in helping your neighbors and going out and the food banks have been incredibly important. And it's, it's, it's that that actually demonstrates the love of Christ rather than me arguing with a scientist whether God exists or not. Um, and, and going back to the science um, religion uh, debate, uh, <laughs> um, has God become the God of the gaps, do you think, Alistair, where, 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 where the religious side is just explaining what science cannot? Or perhaps has science become the, go the, 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 the gap for faith, whereby actually we're explaining it better and they're well, plugging in to us? That's a very interesting reflective question, because the more I learn about science, the more science discoveries that come through, I find the gaps actually get bigger. Mm, not smaller do. you know when you consider the i mean for, for instance you take the probability of this, of one simple enzyme forming by chance in a primeval soup you, you've got a choice of 20 amino acids and the amino acids themselves are made up of carbon hydrogen oxygen nitrogen and sulfur and so they've got to be made in the in the, the correct sequence and not destroyed by the ultraviolet light that's going around and they've got to be in the right order in the right place at the right time and even if you build I say, a simple enzyme um, 150 mil molecules long that so for each 150 you've got a choice of 20 and it's more complicated than that because the amino acids can either bond by what's called a peptide bond or by another bond so that doubles the you, the, 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 the choice that you have there. And then uh, beyond that, amino acids have mirror image forms. They're either in a left-handed form or a right-handed form. And all the enzymes that we have live in, in working living cells are all left-handed forms. So that doubles things again. And the probability of one enzyme, 150 molecules long, forming by chance, is one in 10 to 167. Now that, that may not mean sound an awful lot to you, but scientists tell us that the number of atomic particles in the universe is only 10 to the power of 80, which is you know, significant. <laughs> it's over <Sorry>. twice that. <laughs> um, and then you know, beyond that, um, you, that's, that's just one enzyme, and enzymes can be anything from 20 to 20,000 amino acids long, the ordinary human cell has 1,300 enzymes in it. Then you've got a nucleus, a nucleolus, you've got ribosomes, you've got mitochondria, you've got smooth endoplasmic plasmic reticulum, rough endoplasmic, you, know, you, you can go on. The simple cell is not actually that simple. Yes, sure, and, yes. So, and I um, suppose, Alistair, I mean, you're, you're, you've gone down to kind of the microcosm. I would, uh, probably given my background, would want to go to the macrocosm um, and, and, you know, and think about things like dark matter, which, which scientists are still struggling to, to deal with, and, you know, and the, whole, the whole structure of the universe that doesn't quite fit any of their models. <laughs> well, you've also got the fundamental uh, constants, which if you alter them even by a fraction, would make life as we know it 
impossible to exist. Yeah, the Goldilocks zone, indeed. indeed. Well, it's not just the, it's not just the position within the galaxy, but also if you alter the speed of light or Planck's constant or gravitational mass or magnetic force. I mean, either um, magnetic force, uh, gravity would be so large we couldn't be the size, or if it was less, all the atmosphere would disappear off the Earth. That's right, indeed. Um, indeed. And so if you alter, tinker with the, you know, so it's, it's, people have postulated that the whole of our universe has been almost designed, as it were, um, and very fine-tuned. And the way scientists get around this, actually, is to go into what's called metaphysics. And they say, okay, the chances of it happening are so infinitely small, it's almost impossible. But there are a, you know, a, a, a trillion, 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 trillion parallel universes elsewhere where these things haven't happened and, and, and life hasn't ha occurred, but we're in the lucky one that has. But then you, that, that, that's a, a realm of faith or religion. So it's, 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 it's <laughs> So, so, you know, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm always struck by C.S. Lewis's comment, who said there is no such thing as a coincidence. <laughs> and I mean, I, the more I look at the various the discoveries in science, I, I mean, I forget who it was who said that it's really it, what an unbeliever has to believe to be an unbeliever is completely unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I, to argue, if, if you actually look at the evidence, to argue that everything happened by chance just requires a phenomenal amount of faith. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying it, it, it couldn't have happened, but it is, it's getting as near as close to impossible as you can get in, in, in statistical probability. Um, and um, so for me, it points towards intelligent design. I mean, it doesn't prove Christianity. It doesn't prove the Christ, Judeo-Christian God. No, no. And I, and I think it's also fair to say that a vast amount of our science and scientific discoveries down through the centuries has been built on discoveries and research done by people who believed in a God. It may not have been the Christian God. And also the whole host of mathematics, you know, which came out of Islam. Um, again, one of the three great monotheistic faiths that, um, you know, it's been the origin of really the whole of our scientific life and basis. Um, that's so, a very that's a very good point. Um, so. And so, in some ways, the, the, you know, the, the scientists today who do not believe in a, in intelligent design are actually probably in the minority in the great scheme of things of science down through the centuries and ages. Um, so, so, so we, we've kind of explored you know whether whether science is the enemy of faith. In what ways do you think faith could sometimes be the enemy of science? Oh, I think uh, very easily, uh, to be honest. Um, well, we, you have to understand, or I have to understand, that we now live in a society that is multicultural, has a whole different view, paradigm views of, of, of what, how we came about. And it is no longer good enough for a, a Christian um, or a Muslim for that matter, to say to someone who doesn't believe, but it's in the Bible or it's in the Quran, so I believe it. You have to produce rational um, arguments which stand up to scrutiny and are, are credible to, to support why you believe what you believe. Um, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, it was fair enough to say it's in the Bible, therefore I believe it is good enough for me. Although that is open to how you interpret the Bible, of course. And of course, many denominations and heretics down the years have interpreted the scriptures in a whole variety of ways to justify their particular agendas. Um, but I think if we, if we want to have a credible witness to people around us, we can't just say it's in the Bible, therefore that you know, case closed. We've got to say, well, look, look at all these, look at the circumstantial evidence. I mean, if you go to, um, uh, that, I think Rushmore National Park, and look up at the um, the, the, the the four presidents. It is Russian. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, you look up the four presidents. Yes, yes. Say, okay, that that was created by the wind and the rain and and the sand blowing naturally, and it all happened by chance. And most people say you're nuts. Yeah, that's obviously been, been carved by a human. And in the same sort of way, I mean, I I look at g genetic code, um, you know, the structure of the cell. I, I look at the um, say the, the Goldilocks rules for the planet or the, and things I say well 
that that wasn't chance, surely. Yeah, statistical. It, it must be intelligent designs. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's a combination of intelligence, mass, and energy, and, and directed energy. Um, that, um, and you know, there's enough there. I mean, at the moment, scientists uh, um, are pointing their electric telescopes into the sky, looking for coherent signals coming from outer space, so they can find signs of intelligent life elsewhere. But you, know, you have to look into the cell to see intelligent codes. Yes. <laughs> Clues have been laid for that, us. <laughs> that actually, maybe this, there is actually an intelligent person trying to catch our attention. But yes. would, <laughs> we can't see the wood for the trees. Absolutely. It's a bit like well, a I appreciate story. This, is, this is controversial and you know, people will disagree with me. And ha I'm happy for them to disagree with me and the, they make it very angry what I'm saying. But um, I, I'm trying to do it in a way that's not dogmatic uh, and, and, and open to discussion you know, as, as a reflection. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. And you mentioned there, Alistair, of course, that, you know, that, that a lot of um, archaeologists, uh, you know, as well as scientists have, have been involved recently in, uh, you know, in the last 50, 60 years in, in establishing the historicity of, of some of the biblical events. Um, and yes. we're going to come on to that in, in a moment to, uh, as we discuss the, the star of Bethlehem. At, um, but for the moment, we're going to pause there um, and uh, we're going to hear a song now, which is O oh, Beautiful Star of Bethlehem. And then after the song, uh, we're going to hear the story of the Star of Bethlehem. O oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shining far through shadows dim, giving the light for the have gone Guiding the wise men on their way Unto the place where Jesus lay Oh beautiful star of Bethlehem Shine on Oh beautiful star the hope of life Guiding the pilgrims through the night Over the mountains till the break of dawn Into the land of perfect day It will give out a lovely ray Oh beautiful star of Bethlehem Shine us a lamp to light the way unto the land of perfect day. Oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Oh, beautiful star, the hope of grace for the redeemed, the good and the blessed. Yonder in glory is one. Jesus is now the star divine, brighter and brighter he will shine. Oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Oh, beautiful star the lamp to light the way unto the land of perfect day. Oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on.
Well, thank you. you you've asked me to read um, the, the start of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2, from what, verse 1 to, to 12. So here is now the words of Matthew in the Gospels. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor, and shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. And when they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they had seen in the east, went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country by another way. Amen. Thank you, Alistair. That was very well read. Thank you. That, um... So we have in Matthew this very interesting account of the Magi uh, coming from the east. Um, possibly Persia or Babylonia, uh, and following a star. Um, and that leads us on to our, our second conversation this afternoon <laughs> as to what the possibilities were, what the star might have been. Um, so we're, we're going, for the benefit of our viewers, we're going to outline um, the seven possibilities um, and we'll, we'll tease out whether which ones we think might, or might be more plausible than others. Um, so, um, we'll start with, this was, the first theory is that it was a meteor, uh, and that was favoured by Patrick Moore, um, interestingly enough, which actually surprised me. I, I, I was a bit surprised that Patrick Moore thought that it was a meteor, but there we go. <laughs> he was an unusual man. He was an unusual man, yes. <laughs> I, 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 thought, I thought he was wonderful. He was, he, yeah, he was a, 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 great, a great showman and, but, um, and also a very knowledgeable person as well. He was. At, yeah. um, so what, what do you, I mean, could it have been a meteor? I mean, meteors are quite short-lived, aren't they? they? They don't last for very long. Well, the interesting thing is the way Matthew describes this, because one get, almost gets the impression that the star appeared to them for a short time back home. And then they, they traveled a fair distance. We don't know how long it, uh, what I don't know is whether they all lived together or whether they independently saw uh, the star um, and then conversed with each other and then said, well, we've got to go. Um, and, and, and then they, they traveled all the way to, to Judea and they went to Jerusalem, which obviously was the capital. Uh, and it would almost appear as if they, 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 at that point, they, they couldn't see the star, which is why they went to Jerusalem and had to inquire, you know, where is the king? Um, and the other baffling thing is, of course, Herod and people in Jerusalem hadn't seen this. Yes, that, that I think is an important point. It was only when they told him about it that he became disturbed about the news. And of course, the, then you start sort of branching into Babylonian um, astrology and astronomy and how they actually were able to anticipate things you couldn't actually see because they could only see them during the daylight. Um, but they knew they were there from 
their previous records. And, and then, of course, then it, the star then suddenly reappears, um, you know, after they've been to Herod and leads them to Bethlehem. Or well, they were going to Bethlehem anyway because they, like, they've been told to go there. But the star then miraculously seems to appear over where you know, Jesus and, and, and Mary and Joseph were staying. And so well, one can't help feeling, you know, this wasn't one, if it wasn't meteor, it wasn't one, it must have been several. Yes. <laughs> and uh, and uh, appearing in, in quite an unusual way, which almost defies nature. I, I, I have to comment that you know, the Bible isn't uh, uh, unfamiliar with um, miraculous things occurring in nature. No, that's true. We, we'll we'll, we and we'll come back to the that. Sea, the dividing that's of the right. Jordan. At some points, you have the sun turning back ten degrees, or the sun's remaining still, so Joshua could could finish killing off um, people, and you know, they were fighting. And so the, 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 there are the various things that have happened down, assuming it's you know, they're correctly described. Um, so we need possibly you know, we need to be open to the, that this could be some sort of supernatural event. Um, so but, so if it was a meteor, it probably was more than just one. Um, that, um, and, um, so our other, our, our second theory is that it was um, a uh, comet. So do you want uh, to describe for our for our, uh, our listeners or viewers the difference between a comet and a meteor? I see, because you get meteors, meteorites, meteoroids. Oh, hello. There we oh, go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I thought Giotto, Giotto's painting was a good example. Yeah. Right. Uh, so yes, yeah, so a, mete a meteor is is basically a piece of rock that enters the Earth's atmosphere and 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 burns up as it does so. So it's a very short-lived uh, affair. Right. Uh, a comet, um, of course, uh, is a different thing, and people are probably familiar with Halley's comet, which reappears on a regular basis. Um, and this is our second theory that it may have been a comet and indeed as you can see there in Giotto's painting he has a comet with a tail as the star of Bethlehem. Um, now interestingly um, Chinese astronomer and of course a lot of this Alistair kind of centers on when Jesus was born. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Uh, because if he was born in the reign of Herod the Great which we're certainly told he was then it has to be before Herod died in 4 BC. Yes. So that kind of restricts us a little. So there was a comet uh, recorded by the Chinese in 5 BC and then again in 4 BC, which might explain, as you said, why it kind of disappears and then reappears again because it's two different comets. <laughs> yes. Um, but the only problem with that theory is that generally speaking, a comet was seen as a portent of doom. Right, um, yes. Rather than a, a, you know, rather than bringing good news, um, and we need only thing. I mean, you know, with the Battle of Hastings, Halley's Comet was seen, um, yes. and of course that brought to the end um, Anglo-Saxon England. But well, I suppose well, the other way of looking at it yes. might be, and this is this is an interesting one. Um, in a way, the comet did mark the end of something and the beginning of something new, if it was yes. a comet. Yes, I mean, because Herod probably didn't live terribly long afterwards. He didn't. Yeah, well, if it was that comet, certainly he wouldn't have done. Um, and of course, after he died, you know, his kingdom was broken up amongst his sons, so it didn't really survive. And then, of course, the Romans eventually took control. Um, so, yes, unfortunately, for, unfortunately for um, Salome, managed to rescue a whole lot of the Jewish wise men at that point. You, you, know, <laughs> you know the story. Salome and you, you go on, you tell the story. Oh, well, well, there were a lot of Salomes around, but Salome, his sister, I think it was his sister, um, Herod did not want Judea to rejoice on the news of his death. So he rounded up all the sages of Jerusalem, and, or in the, or the area, and he had imprisoned them down by um, Jericho. And the order was that as soon as the news of his death arrived, they were all to be killed. And so Israel would be in mourning. Um, uh, for, uh, coinciding with his death, uh, but Salome managed to get word out down to um, to direct Jericho first, and, re and and released all the wise men before news of Herod's death came through. So there was great rejoicing. <laughs> yes, <laughs> great rejoicing on two counts. <laughs> yes. So so it, so the comet, I suppose, might have been bad news for Herod, 
Yes. Um, but it could have been good news for everyone else. So will we, will we park that one, do you think? We, we, can, we can park it. I mean, right. I, I, I'm open to any suggestion because I, okay. I don't have an answer. I think um, the, d the, dates are, are, the dates fit rather nicely. And, and the fact there were two comets, one in five and one in four, would explain certainly yes. you know, the, the appearance and then the disappearance and then the reappearance. Um, so, so that kind of does fit. Um, so I suppose so the other thing you have to juggle with one. is the, um, the, the announcement of the, um, the, the, the whole world being taxed. And of course, the, the, and yes, of course, that's in Luke's, yes. Uh -huh, yes. Yeah. All right, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll leave that then. Yeah, I, I think the, 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 the we'll one thing that. about that is it, it may, if you look at the text very closely, it may, it may actually mean that Jesus was born before Quirinius took the census rather than at yes. the time that Jesus took, yes. uh, that Quirinius took the census. So it, it can be read either way. Yes. Um, I, I have a theory that, in fact, it was a religious holiday that, and they arrived right. in Bethlehem, and that's why it was busy because it was so close to Jerusalem. But anyway, that's a <laughs> that's another conversation for another time, yes. perhaps. But um, so that that theory number three um, is that the star of Bethlehem was a planet or a star. So the the leading contenders are the star Sirius or the planet Venus. And I know myself um, very often in December, particularly. Um, Venus is quite low on the southern sky, and many people will say to me, "Oh, the star of Bethlehem's reappeared because they see Venus." And right. I think yes. Um, I, 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 how do you feel about that one, Alistair? That's well. The, 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 one has to realise that what appeared made a tremendous impression upon the Magi, um, and it, it motivated them to travel a long way with precious gifts. You know, to come and see this this child and to worship him, um, and so there must have been something more than just an annual appearance of of, of a planet or or a, st or a regular star. There must have been something very special about this which had drawn their attention to it. So I suspect that that probably isn't a very serious contender. Um, okay. Um, um, the, but if, if it was, it, it, it must be because it, it had arisen in a, an unusual uh, zodiac constellation or is in combination with something else which had caught their attention. Um, so there, there would have to be something unusual about it for that to be the case. Uh, but that's, that's what I would suggest anyway. Yes, I, I would absolutely agree with you. I think, I think we can rule that one out because I think, I think they, they would have certainly known about Sirius, the dog star, and they would have known yes. about Venus. So. Um, you know, it, it, as you correctly say, it would have had to be something somewhat unusual. Um, and you referred there to the possibility of, of what we call planetary conjunction. Um, yes. Let me just see if I can bring up another picture. So we just had one, haven't we? We, we have, yes, we have indeed. <laughs> we have indeed. Um, is this what I'm looking for? Oh, yes, this is what I'm looking for. So here we go. Let me just do a little um, sc screen share. Um, there we are. And we will see there. There we go. Um, so, yes, the great conjunction that appeared on the 21st of December 2020 um, and Jupiter, the planets Jupiter and Saturn were at their closest since 1623. And I think if I remember correctly before that, it was 1226. So it doesn't happen that often. Um, and of course, to the naked eye, it would it would seem as if they, they had kind of fused together into one very bright, um, um, very bright star. Yes. But, um, the other possibility, uh, so, so that actually happened, Jupiter and Saturn, um, apart from happening in 2020, it also happened in 7 BC. So again, it fits with our time scale. Um, also Pisces to some people represented Israel, didn't it? That's right. Pisces um, and, and Jupiter was the king star. So it was a yes. sign of, of uh, a new king arising. Um, so that, that's maybe quite a strong contender. And, and as, as you correctly said, Alistair, earlier, that would be something that, that the Magi would have to interpret. So it wouldn't be something that was immediately obvious to the man in the street. Yes. Um, the, the, you know, that was something that was of significance to the astrologers or the astronomers for the same in those days. Um, the other possibility is Jupiter and the star Regulus, um, who were in the constellation of Leo in 2 to 3 BC, although that's a wee bit later. So yes, I'm not sure that that 
necessarily yeah, that's after Herod's died. So. That, um, so, so maybe that's another one we want to park. Yes. <laughs> so we've got a possible comet or a possible planetary conjunction. Um, and just to show there's our, our, our viewers what a, a conjunction is. Um, the other possibility is a supernova, which again, I will just see if I can bring up. Uh, here we go. But, um, and if this were the case, this would have really been quite something. Yes. Um, it would have been a very obvious um, event. Uh, in but surely the noted by there, a lot of different civilizations. Well, that's the drawback. There, there is very little evidence for a supernova happening in that time scale. Um, there is some evidence, um, and I can even give you the date, <laughs> uh, that on the 23rd of February in the year 4 BC, there was a pulsar supernova, um, which is not quite the same thing as a supernova, um, right. which is called the Hulse-Taylor pulsar supernova if anybody wants to look that one up um right. so that, that does kind of fit with the time scale but it wouldn't have been quite such a spectacular sight as a supernova so I, I'm, people may not have noticed it yeah well it would yeah it would yeah. be like a pulsing star which is why it's called a pulsar <laughs> yes. so yeah I, I i think i would yeah i'm like you know, i'd be i would be slightly dubious about that one yes. that, um that's um because I think if you know and there's no trace of there's no trace of a supernova happening in that period even today uh, and we would still see the effects of it two thousand years later because it's such a right a, yes. a huge thing really but, um, uh, then there is what's called a helical rising yes. um, which basically means that a planet usually a planet but sometimes a star. Uh, appears behind the sun and then kind of looks as if it's going backwards. Um, and I'm just going to do another uh, screen share so that we can have a look at it. Because um, I know some scholars have argued that the, the, the Greek and, and, and Matthew, rather than saying actually in the east, it says it was actually was in the rising. That's right. Yeah. And it was, it was Matthew actually describing a helical event. Um, people. Uh, scholars will debate that. Um, uh, That's right. The star at its rising. No, you're you're right. Um, and of course, in in that situation, um, the sun, of course, is going from east to west. Yes. But whatever you know, if it was Jupiter, and um, that's certainly one possibility, um, it would have seemed to the, the Jupiter because it's going <laughs> yes. right the sun in the wrong direction, so to speak. It would have looked as if it was moving east to west. Right. Yes. And of course, that would have been the correct direction for the Magi because they're traveling from the east to the west. Right. Um, so, uh, and that did happen. Jupiter and the moon were in a helical rising in April of 6 BC in the constellation of Aries. So again, it does, that one would fit certainly in terms of time. Right. Um, and again, would would have not been uh, of significance to anyone except those that were studying the heavens it wouldn't have been obvious right, to Herod yes. and his court but, um, so what do we think do we think we want to will we park that one as well that leaves us with three well, yeah, I think, I, I, i'm sure you'll find the people who will back that one right <laughs> 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 we, we should have almost had a, a kind of online vote at the end of this as to which people <laughs> thought was the most likely to be. <laughs> uh, the, so, yeah, that would maybe be quite a good idea. So, yes, if you're if you're watching this, um, email us in. Tell us what you think. Um, send us a text and tell us what your theory is. Or which uh, one. I also the, read something about hair stars. Is, does that mean anything to you? Um, there was a, a paper. Um, produced uh, back from 2002 from a, a conference on a uh, symposium about the star of Bethlehem and they spoke, spoke about hair stars but um, I just it was um, I didn't really quite fully understand that I think the Chinese would have seen these things and described them but um, um, but they, they weren't convinced that that was actually a, a proper explanation um, All right. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Maybe the Magi changed their kind of kuffer to. <laughs> <laughs> now, the final theory, um, and, and you, you did mention this earlier, um, is, of course, the possibility that it was a localized event. In other words, it was a supernatural event, or indeed, uh, we could say a super, uh, an unidentified flying object. There is actually another possibility, which, All right, some okay. people, which some people actually will hate me for, but I'm putting it in because I'm being honest, I'm not saying I believe it, but um, it's, it's just when you look at the, math, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew was a Jew writing to Jewish people, and so he was using techniques of teaching and, and, and using illusions and concepts and thoughts that would register with his Jewish audience. And as you probably know, Matthew is divided into a prologue and an epilogue. And in the middle, uh, scholars will disagree as to whether it's five sections or three sections um, mimicking the Torah. But even if, if, you, if it was three sections, you take the prologue and the epilogue, again, you've got five sections of the Torah. Um, which, uh, but you have certainly five discourses that Jesus gives throughout the course. And then in the, 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 you know, the prologue, um, with which this passage occurs in, at the very beginning, You've got, you've got Matthew emphasizing the son of David, the son of David, the son of David, um, as the, you know, the long expected Messiah. And he actually plays fast and loose with the genealogy. Um, I don't know whether you've noticed that. I he, haven't looked at that in any detail. Well, but you, he, he, he groups three, 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 there's three groups of genealogies, so all containing 14 um, people in it. So you've got 14, 14, 14. And to do this, he's actually had to, to uh, skip a couple of kings out. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm assuming they were some of the bad kings. <laughs> I, um, I would have to double check. Uh, <laughs> it wouldn't be difficult. <laughs> but he, he missed a couple of kings out to do this. So he he said, Why is he doing this? Well, well, he was using um, a, a Jewish uh, teaching technique of Gematreya, which you may have heard of. I have heard of that. Yes. Um, and he applied numerical values to to uh, David in Hebrew, D David. You have uh, uh, Dalit is four, Vav is six, and Dalit is four. And you add that up, you get 14. So you have uh, 14, 14, 14, David, David, David. And so Matthew is um, making a very strong point to his Jewish leaders, uh, readers. You know, this is the son of David, and here's supporting evidence for that um, in the genealogy. And then... Um, we then come to the star, and you have uh, Gentile, which again, were the Magi Gentiles? There's a huge debate about that as to whether they were Jewish or whether they were uh, uh, Gentiles. And, and, uh, but we mentioned that they probably were from Babylon, um, coming, looking for the star. And if you go back into the Old Testament, you have a very prominent Gentile um, uh, prophet called Balaam who Philo, in his writings, describes as a Magos, um, or, which is a singular of Magi. Singular of Magi. And, and we have uh, Balaam prophesying, a star will arise out of Jacob and a scepter out of Judah. And th this concept was actually used uh, later on in the Bar Kokhba uh, rebellion against the Romans. And uh, they, they called Bar Kokhba the, the son, the son, that means son of the star, because they, he was declared to be the Messiah. And, and so some people think that Matthew was using the star uh, analogy and the Gentile prophet uh, to, to mirror Balaam prophesying the coming of the Messiah. Um, so because more, more, of a, more a symbolic um, and so, so So in the same way, he played a little bit, of, he, he was a little bit of sort of poetic or um, freedom in describing the genealogy. Was he being a little bit poetic with the um, yes, with the economical star? with the truth? I think. Yes. Would be. <laughs> uh, and the, so the, the analogy goes further than that because obviously, as you as you probably realise, uh, Moses was a prototype of, of of Jesus with the Passover and the the Exodus, and he and Moses himself prophesied that uh, a prophet like unto me will arise, and um, uh, that's alluded to in the Gospels. Is this the prophet? Um, and so Jesus was the prophet like unto Moses. And um, just like in Egypt, where a wicked king, Pharaoh, tried to kill all the, the male children in the Nile, here we have the wicked king, Herod, killing all the male babies in, in Bethlehem. So you've got these kind of motifs yes. arcing back <clears throat> to... Um, so it's possible that... I mean, that, that, I mean, I believe there was a star. 
but um, some people might say this was just really a literary technique that yeah. Matthew was using to make the point to his Jewish readers, look, you're okay, you can believe that Jesus is the Messiah because this is the evidence. Yes, I've got, I mean, I, I suppose with the Herod and the, the slaughter of the innocents um, story, Alistair, which uh, which we, we, we normally commemorate on the 28th of December, um, yeah. that, that Augustus, the emperor in Rome, once famously said, pl playing on the Greek words, that he would much rather be Herod's pig than his son, yes, because the pig that, had, yeah. <laughs> well, because he had, had, had a higher chance of survival. And of course he did kill yes. uh, some of his family, including his wife at one stage. So yes. it, it, so the, the slaughter of the innocents um, may not be quite such, uh, you know, it's maybe there's an element of truth in it, although, Oh, you know, I would, man. Yeah, man. absolutely. I'd be inclined to say that, you know, it wasn't hundreds of children. It was maybe a dozen or so. Yes. But it's not without out with the bounds of possibility oh, that Herod would quite, have done this. Well within the character of the Absolutely. Man. Absolutely. He was paranoid about his throne. He was. Um, at, uh, so, <clears throat> so, we've, so we've now got eight theories. <laughs> I was going to say just in relation to the localised event, the, the, the sort of... Um, you know that it, it didn't behave like it didn't behave like a normal star in that it it moves and it stops, which might lend credence to the fact that it was either of supernatural origin or you know was of natural origin, but we just don't know what it was. Um, I'm sorry, the book that I ordered hasn't arrived in time. There's a very good, <laughs> very good conference of 2014 in in Holland. Right, we, we, we'll, we'll, we can revise this next year when you've got the book. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, that book, that conference drew together um, Babylonian astrology, Greco-Roman astrology, Jewish astrology, um, uh, along with um, uh, other sort of uh, current th you know, thoughts of the time and combining it with modern uh, astronomical techniques. So it'd be interesting to see what their conclusion was, but um, I, I, I hadn't managed to get a copy of it online and the, the book's not going to arrive from Holland until another, another fortnight. Oh, well. <laughs> but when I get it, I'll let you see it. That would be lovely. That would be lovely. So we're left, I think, um, with three, well, possibly four contenders. Um, so we've got the comet theory, the planetary conjunction theory, the helical rising theory. Uh, so actually five, the localized event, possibly. Or, as you said, the, the Matthew using a kind of poetic um, analogy uh, for the birth of Jesus. So, uh, all I've got to say to our viewers is answers on a postcard, please. Do let us know what you think. That would be wonderful. Uh, um, thank you, Alistair, for, for today and for engaging in what's been a very interesting conversation. It's interesting, I think, that, that you know, for, for all the passage of the years and all the Christmases that have come and gone, there is something about the Star of Bethlehem that still draws us in. It's, it's, it's magical, isn't it? It is. It, it, it is. draws us into the story and, yes. and we want to know more. Um, yes. And, and maybe, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe we should be, leave it like that, leave it with the air of mystery. Yes, I agree. I think uh, I, I like the word mystery. That, uh, and, and also to remember um, that, in a sense, that the real star of the show was actually the Christ child, was Jesus. And that yes, it was what yes. the star pointed to rather yes. than the star itself. So, yes. That, um, so I want to thank Alistair very much for being with us today. And um, just to let um, everyone know that the next program uh, is going to be led by Graeme Taylor. I don't know if Graeme's got a theme yet, but. Um, uh, Nardi and I are going to have a little break, um, just let someone else be involved, <laughs> and um, we look forward to that. I just wanted to end with um, a little blessing, but before I do that, I'm just going to bring up uh, another picture um, for you so that we can use that uh, as the background to the blessing. Uh, so this is the little picture that I wanted to share with everyone. And it just kind of reflects our theme for today. So let's end with this blessing that was written by Ruth Burgess. A blessing of the dark sky be yours, of the white moon and the faraway stars. A blessing of the cold earth be yours, of the hoarfrost and the drifts of snow. A blessing of the warm hearth be yours, 
of a lighted fire and a loving home. The blessing of the Trinity be yours, star maker, Christ child, spirit of light. May that blessing be with you in these long winter days and nights and forevermore. Amen. Amen. So thank you for today and we look forward to sharing with you again in the very near future. From all of us here on Reflections from Dundee, a very goodbye.